Hey there, Dr. Mark here, and in today's video, I'm gonna show you everything you need to manage high cholesterol. We'll talk about what needs to happen to lower the risk of heart attacks, from plant-based diets to the role of saturated fat, dietary fiber, and yes, even the introduction of medication and statins. We'll talk about how to assess risk and what questions to ask doctors and cardiologists. And here's my promise to you, watch until the end of this video and you'll have the most up-to-date and thorough insight around the science of cholesterol and heart disease. And I'm gonna take this in a slightly different direction Direction, and here's why. Recently, I had some blood work done after I had a lingering finger injury that just wouldn't go away. During the winter, I did something to my middle finger and it was an injury that just lasted for months. I even had a hard time actually lifting plates to put them in the microwave, which would have helped the problem I'm about to describe, but it didn't. Anyways, the doctor wanted to rule out it wasn't gout or something strange, so I got some blood work done. And the good news is it was just a soft tissue injury that was taking its sweet time to go away. But there was bad news too, and my blood work had flagged high total cholesterol and high LDL. My jaw dropped when I read the results. So here's what we're looking at here for me. We have high total cholesterol, which is gonna be a fat-like substance that travels around your bloodstream. And as you know, total cholesterol can be separated into two main types, HDL or high density cholesterol, which is sometimes known as the good cholesterol. HDL is considered good because it can carry cholesterol and fat to your liver for processing and disposal. And as you can see on here, mine is fine. LDL on the other hand, which is high for me, is the bad cholesterol. LDL is found in the body in higher amounts, but when it gets too high, it can lead to plaque buildup in the arteries, leading to heart disease and even a heart attack. Also of note is triglycerides, which are the actual fat molecules in your blood that supply tissues with energy. Usually when you have high levels of total cholesterol and high LDL, low HDL and high triglycerides, this is something known as dyslipidemia, which increases the risk of heart disease. And there's some more thought and study that goes into the ratios of these molecules, which may be important, but more on that later. Now at this point, I'm reading this stuff and I'm actually in a bit of disbelief because a lot of the things that you need to do to reduce these levels of cholesterol, I'm already doing. But with that being said, how these levels are influenced has been the subject of intense scientific study and debate for many years. Is it the cholesterol you eat or dietary cholesterol? Or is it dietary fat and other risk factors like smoking and exercise? Or is it just genetics? And do these levels even matter? Do they actually predict anything? Even more so, cholesterol isn't bad. We actually need it to live and survive. Check this out. There's no human life without lipids. We need fatty acids for energy. We absolutely need cholesterol for our cell membranes. They provide integrity and the ability for membranes to signal no cholesterol, no cell membranes, no cells. No podcast tonight if you and I weren't constructed of cells. So cholesterol also is a precursor to several hormones that are necessary for life. And cholesterol is a substance from which the liver makes bile acids. And if it didn't make them, we couldn't absorb anything and we'd be in a bad way too. So cholesterol is so crucial that evolution knew we have to give every cell in the body the ability to manufacture, synthesize cholesterol. And we also have to maybe develop a lipid transportation system that could track lipids, the energy carrying lipids like triglycerides, uh, and even cholesterol if needed to a tissue that says, hey, I need cholesterol. It has to go from where cholesterol is being produced to somebody who wants to use it. And that is the problem because plasma is our vehicle, how we transport things in the human body. And plasma is pretty much a total aqueous water solution. Like most things, normal amount of something is totally fine, but if it's prolonged and higher over longer periods of time, that's when it becomes problematic. But what causes high cholesterol and what to do about it, that's what we're here to talk about today. Anyways, my doctor phoned shortly after getting these results, and this is what she had to say. Well, we're gonna take some time to figure this out and not push any medications, just just yet. Drugs, really, I'm 35 years old, track everything I eat, I exercise every day, I don't think I could add in more exercise if I wanted to, and eat mainly unprocessed foods. This doesn't seem quite fair. I actually told some close friends and family this, and their reaction was, well, if that's true, we're all doomed. I didn't want to feel bad for myself, but I actually felt the same way. But it was an important wake-up call for me, and I've been trying to treat myself like I would any of my nutrition clients, which means, number one, some of this is out of my control, it's just the hand I 
I've been dealt and it's not embarrassing. And this isn't something that I've talked about openly too much in my health career, but it is worth mentioning. In 2016, my dad passed away suddenly from a heart attack. He was 57 years old. He smoked most of his life. He was a lovely man and father, but he didn't do enough to take care of his health, which obviously pains me a bit because having a PhD in this stuff and dedicating my life to helping others, you want to be able to help the people around you. But I wasn't able to, and to be completely honest, I'm not sure I would have been able to, to each their own, that's the way he lived his life. But not seeing Amy and I get married or ever meeting his grandkids, that's the brutal reality of this stuff. So when I start to see this stuff come up for me, quite honestly, it terrifies me. I am not willing to go down this path, even if I am already doing a lot of the things right. And there's gotta be some other stuff that I can do, which brings me to my next point. There's still tons I can do to improve my health and take action. And this is the part I've been focused on, based on the most current up-to-date scientific guidelines. But not only that, in true Dr. Mark method fashion, how you can actually apply this stuff and take action. That's the important part. So what do you actually do about this stuff? What does the science say? Let's start there. First off, dietary cholesterol. After many years of being told to avoid cholesterol, that relationship isn't all that clear. What we've learned is that the cholesterol that we eat, dietary cholesterol, has little impact on the amount of serum cholesterol or the cholesterol that's actually circulating your bloodstream. In most governing bodies like the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology have shifted their guidelines from avoiding cholesterol at all costs to just improving overall dietary patterns, which is great. So it's not actually dietary cholesterol, but what does impact serum cholesterol levels? So I can say this one with certainty. We have trans fats. Trans fats increase LDL cholesterol and decrease HDL. Most of the trans fats found in our human diet are from partially hydrogenated oils found in processed foods. And these are actively being phased out of the food supply, but can also be found in margarine, although most margarine has been reformulated to not have any in it, but also fried food, commercial baked goods, as well as some snack foods. Check food labels, look for the words hydrogenated oils and trans fats, and avoid these foods at all costs. But we also have saturated fat. There is some conflicting evidence on this, but for the most part, people would see improvements in their serum cholesterol levels just by eliminating saturated fat. Most government recommendations say to limit saturated fat to around 7 to 10% of total calories, but more benefits would be seen when foods high in saturated fats, particularly processed meat, fried food, pastry, are replaced with foods that are higher in unsaturated or polyunsaturated fats, like olive oil, nuts, seeds, and fatty fish these type of swaps may be enough to lower LDL cholesterol in itself. Next up, we have the impact that dietary carbohydrate has on cholesterol levels. Now keep in mind, all individuals are different and it may not be enough just to limit trans fat and saturated fat to reduce cholesterol levels. Especially when diets that are high in processed carbohydrates like refined flour and white bread, sugary beverages, and sweets have been associated with higher levels of blood triglycerides and lower HDL. Conversely, the presence of less processed carbohydrates, think whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, beans, and lentils, we see the opposite effect, and that has an improvement on blood lipids. The main driver here is most likely dietary fiber, especially soluble fiber that has been shown to lower LDL. Foods like oats, beans, and lentils contain soluble fiber that will bind to the LDL and help remove it right from the body. Now, when you think about carbohydrates, you may be thinking about insulin and insulin resistance and how this might play into blood cholesterol. Now, the research does show that there's a connection between insulin levels and cholesterol levels, with people having type 2 diabetes being twice as likely to develop cardiovascular disease. And this may have to do with influencing lipoproteins, but also blocking lipoprotein lipase, which is going to lead to higher levels of serum triglycerides. How you get to this stage and how to solve it is less well understood. It could be related to obesity, genetics, or even a lack of exercise, a bunch of different things. And usually the best solution to reverse it is just general lifestyle improvement, adding an exercise and moving towards a healthy body weight, which typically means some form of calorie or carbohydrate restriction. Lastly, overall dietary patterns and the impact on body weight can also play into this. Excess body weight, especially when it comes in the form of abdominal obesity, is linked to alterations in cholesterol levels as well as risk of heart disease, which means that losing excess body weight and moving towards a healthy body weight, which has been shown to decrease total cholesterol, 
and LDL, as well as triglycerides and raise HDL. Now there are some other non-dietary things that can impact this process like smoking and exercise. Smoking can damage blood vessels, which lead to plaque and cholesterol buildup. And not being physically active can lead to an increase in LDL and decrease in HDL because your body's just not moving as much or clearing that stuff. But let's say you're doing all this stuff. You exercise, you eat a balanced diet, and you monitor alcohol and your stress levels like me. Is there anything else going on to explain this stuff? Despite what they do, some individuals will inherit certain genes that make them predisposed to higher levels of cholesterol. And despite all the lifestyle factors that they could employ, there's not much they can do to overcome that and there's no shame in it. And this is where statins or medication come into play. They work by blocking a substance in the body that will limit the production of cholesterol, sometimes reducing LDL by anywhere between 30 to 55%. Some of the earlier statins had worse side effects, we're talking myopathy and fatigue and even low libido. Although newer drugs are better tolerated, although not without side effects entirely. And that's the brief recap around what we know influences serum cholesterol levels. Which brings me back to my situation and where I found myself and what I was gonna do about it. So I can't really remember the last time I had blood work done. It was probably around three to four years ago. So I don't know exactly when my LDL levels and cholesterol started to rise, but I will tell you this, although I watch what I eat and exercise exercise and train almost every day, there's a few things, underlying things that could have caused these high levels of cholesterol. The first is genetics and my personal history. So there's definitely that at play, but also since kids, and this is an excuse, I've been just eating much more red meat. The kids enjoy eating it, meatballs and burgers. It's well tolerated and enjoyed. So we eat more of it. And there'd be quite a few situations where we'd have it for dinner. And then I'd also have it for leftovers the next day. And that cycle would repeat. So I've been eating red meat a couple times per day. And don't get me wrong. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with red meat. But in my situation where that was matched with also higher levels of carbohydrate, it just might've ended up being way too much food. But also there was my body weight. And usually my body weight increases over the winter where I'm not moving as much. I spend all day sitting down and not moving, teaching people how to eat on the internet. But my weight creeped up to around 90 kilos or 198 pounds, which is a lot on my five foot seven frame. So I could stand to get leaner. And here's what I plan to do about it. My aim was to lose around eight to 10 kilos or 15 to 20 pounds over three to four months by doing the following, eating around 2,400 to 2,600 calories per day with less of that being from saturated fat, trying to limit red meat to around once per week while also aiming for more plant-based protein sources. I would also try to limit my alcohol consumption to around one to two drinks per week. Add in more fiber and nuts and seed. We're talking about oatmeal and flaxseed almost every day as well as bump my daily steps to around 10,000 steps per day and add in around one to two spin classes per week. This is actually the exact plan I messaged over to my family doctor and she's super supportive. She wants to see what I can do over the next three to six months before revisiting more blood work. And one thing she mentioned that we'll actually measure next time is another protein, apolipoprotein B. ApoB is a marker that measures the erythrogenic lipoproteins in your blood. Higher levels of ApoB are associated with a higher risk of heart disease, where standard blood panels give you the total level of cholesterol. ApoB gives you an indication of how much of this cholesterol is being carried through your bloodstream. It's much more specific and a better tool for risk assessment. I'm gonna detail this and my own personal results in a future video, so stay tuned for that. Now, as great as all those tips are, if you're really serious about starting a nutrition coaching business, the next thing I'll have you do is check out this video I've linked up right here. Today, I showed you everything you need to know about the science of cholesterol. Next up is going to be everything you need to know about the science of gut health. So check it out now and I'll see you in the next video.